All right, everyone, welcome back to the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel, and Ray Weens is joining us on the podcast today. Ray has um, done two bears for me already. Ray is a taxidermist, and he's done two bears for me already and working on uh, a third one, not a full-blown rug, but but just the hide. And he originally got introduced to me. You did my buddy. Do you, remember, do you know a guy named Tyler Shap? I do, yeah. Yeah, so you did Tyler's Cougar, and Tyler was a, was a timber cruiser at the forestry company that I worked at, and he was the one who originally um, said I should get in touch with you. But anyways, a bunch of people on the podcast have really been interested about, you know, hunting seasons coming up. What's the best way to, you know, prepare hides or do field work or, you know, how do taxidermists prefer to get stuff and then, you know, salt, no salt, freeze, no freeze. So I reached out to Ray, you were good enough to say, yeah, let's throw up a Q and a, get some questions and dive into it. So first off the bat, I know how busy you are and I want to thank you for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you having me on and, uh, you know, it's always good to be able to get on here and answer a few questions. So there's a few less mistakes at the starting point and, uh, yeah, happy to do it. So maybe to kick us off, a little bit of background. How did you find yourself getting into taxidermy? How how long ago was that? Um, and what's the path been like for you ever since? Uh, you know, I've been doing it full time for 16 years now. Um, originally, I just, I've you know, I've always been a hunter. I've just had a, you know, I always appreciated taxidermy, liked looking at it. So um, but I was working at a, a mill, didn't really, wasn't something that I actually planned on doing, but uh, went through a period of my life there where I really hated that kind of work and didn't want to carry on with that. So I um, started to pursue or look different things uh, that I could do, and taxidermy was a, something that was interesting to me. So I reached out to a taxidermist, a guy named Bob Marchuk down in Burnaby back then, and uh and, uh, you know, he was actually just starting a school at the time or considering starting a school for it um, out there. And, uh, you know, I had to pester him and pester him and pester him. But eventually he took me on and started that up and and went there. So um, actually it worked out quite well um, right when I made the decision to go there and do that. The, the mill actually went under and huh. we got a severance package and... Uh, Literally the day that I was going to resign. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, uh, and and the, the severance package covered the cost of the schooling. And so that's that's what I did. How long does it typically take? Like if we were going to talk about an apprenticeship, but if somebody's a pretty dedicated individual, how long do you think it takes from like, okay, this is something I would like to try and pursue to the point where, and maybe it's just a smaller you know, animal at first to the point where you can actually turn out something decent. You know, that's, it's going to be so different for okay. everybody. Um, you know, um, I've seen people, you're not going to learn it all for a long time. I mean, a course is a starting point. Yeah. So, you know, um, be leery of anyone that's going to offer you a course that tells you that you're going to be a, you know, professional taxidermist at the end of that. Uh, you know, there's so many variations in animals and, just different situations that, that you know you got to work on quite a few of them but as far as like i mean some people are just a natural and they just pick it up you know right away and, and other people um it's a bit of a struggle but they they work through it and get it and um and uh yeah it, it's different depends on natural um aptitude i guess so that makes yeah. sense um What's what's some of your favorite stuff to do, and has that changed? Like, as your skill level has has increased, has have you found new things that you maybe presented a different challenge, or yeah, what's what's some of your favorite things to animals to to do? I don't know if I've got a specific favorite. I mean, you know, you like working on sheep because they're kind of a prestigious animal, right? And um, you know, same with the cats. Got to do a couple African lions that you know those it was an honor to get to do them and they were a fun challenge but overall i'd say um the one nice thing in bc as tax earned in bc is the variety we get so right. you know um and i like that i i just like i don't i don't have a specific favorite okay. they're all you know they're all good and, and but get you know i get everything from african lions to you know goats deer sheep wolves and then you know stuff from new zealand and 
Ireland or wherever. So we get quite a big variety and that's, that's what I enjoy. Do you think there's something you're known for in particular? For me, maybe it's just my own experience, but I think cats and bears, especially because the cat's faces and some of those things are so hard and some of the cats you've done are just like so good looking. But if you, if you think about it, do you think you're known for any one particular thing or is it, is it the variety? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've had people say that they like my cats. Um, but you know, there's a lot of good taxidermists around doing good work in that area too. So I don't think I'm specifically known for any one thing. I think, uh, you know, try and offer good quality product on everything and good service and stuff like that, I think is maybe, maybe more it. Yeah. Okay. I think the reason cats stand out to me is like, it's so everybody's seen wonky cats, like deer, for example, seem to be something that like, it's, you see a lot of like normal looking deer. You don't see a lot of super wonky looking deer, but like cats are really something people can screw up. Like you see a weird cat and you're like, that is a bad piece of taxidermy. Yeah. And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, one of them is, um, you know, they just have a lot more expression. Eyes are on the front of the head. They're predators. Um, you know, as their ears move, the the head changes. And so forms come, you know, for deer, you can get forms and, and they're, you know, they, they don't need a lot of modification, whereas cats to, to really get the proper look, you have to do a lot of clay work. It's not just, um, you know, slide it onto a, to a standard form. So there's a little bit more sculpting and, and maybe a little bit more of an eye for what you need to put where, and that's a, you know, a challenge because you're, you're kind of doing that. Like, you know, you're trying to build what an animal should look like with the skin on, but without having the skin on. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, they're definitely a challenge, and and I think the smaller cats are a bigger challenge than the larger cats. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, <clears throat> let's um let's jump into some Q and A here, and I'm going to open up with a a fairly broad question that we might need to uh, kind of establish some boundaries because the the actual que- question is salt or freezer or both, and maybe a better question would be what are the circumstances under which would be uh, you know you would be, you know, the ideal application would be, would be one or the other. Like when would you want to use salt versus when would you want to freeze? And what are your thoughts in general on that? Well, the best thing you could do is salt. It's like salt is always one option. So um, if you know how to cape, if you know how to skin, but, but when you're doing that, it's not just, you know, cut the head and paws off and, and, and salt the body. Like um, you need to know how to, pull the head out, how to turn the lips and ears and nose inside out. Um, you know, you want to get the hide free of meat and fat as best you can. And, uh, you know, if you're doing a bear, you want to get the paws out or the hooves on a, on a sheep or whatever. Um, and, but I mean, if you can get an animal in the first day, skinned out, turned, cleaned up like that and insult, that's your best bet for having a, you know, no issues later on with, you know, bacterial growth or whatever that can cause slippage. So salt is the answer to that. Um, most people aren't super comfortable doing that. So, I mean, I highly recommend when you're, you know, when you're shooting animals that aren't trophies, uh, you know, when you're not planning on mounting it, take the time to practice it. I mean, there's lots of good videos. There's an article on my website that I, that I wrote a while back, um, you know, that kind of has picture detail, but, but take some time, learn how to do it. And I mean, if you're in the field, especially, you know, 30, 40 kilometers back or waiting for a plane, um, salt is hands down your best bet. So just because fine salt, sorry. Okay. No, 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 that's good. That, because that's actually a question I had and I was going to follow that with even some more details. So I, like many people are heading in for sheep this August. If you were a solo guy heading in for one sheep, how much salt would you bring with you? If you wanted to bring out you know, let's say the full cape, you were going to do, you were going to do a full body mount. Full body mount. So, I mean, there's a few things you want to consider there too. Are you flying in? Are you hiking in? Is the hunt, you're going solo. So, yeah. I mean, th- that's going to be the hunt is over once you take a ram or are you wanting to stay and look for other animals? Um, you know, probably not as a solo hunt, but, uh, but, uh, so those are the things to consider. If you're going to be there for a few days, um, you know, if I'm going, I guess it doesn't really matter how I fly in or hike in. If I'm, if I'm heading from base camp, like flying in, I mean, I'll bring a 40 pound bag of 
bulk salt on the plane and i mean you know i can just dump it out after right um, if i don't end up getting anything so you know that's not an issue uh when we're spiking out i'll take um you know a two liter of coke worth of fine salt in the backpack okay and um you know one way you could do it is take a couple of those and then you know ditch one halfway if you're going to be way back there and and um you know so the first day the first night i mean overnight your first night you know typically you're not in too much danger of losing it unless it's a scorching day um but uh you know next morning get it caped out get it cleaned up take some time with it and then um you know a two liter of salt if you've got a nice clean hide it should it should cover that i mean it you know more is better but you know, that should be able to get good coverage on a cheap size animal. Okay. And then, you know, um, then you go back to where, you know, when you get back to camp, you'll have another bit there. So you're going to scrape that off after a day, after 24 hours, it'll become all sloppy and messy and full of moisture. So you're just going to scrape that off and then put another application on. Um, and then typically what we do is after it's been in salt for two days, you can hang it in a branch or something just to get some air circulation around it and you'll notice it starts to kind of dry out or get a little bit crispy stuff like that and once it's at that point you know um you can fold it up and i mean it's pretty stable at that point okay that's very helpful um could you walk through the pros and cons of beetles versus boiling for euros and skulls in general uh, well, um, boiling, you know, you can, there's always the chance of overboiling. So you're going to weaken the bone structure. Um, you can't keep the detail in, or it's, it's much harder to keep those detailed bones in the nasal passage. You know, you've got, um, all those fine honeycomb shaped bones inside there. Um, so beetles, you're going to typically get a much nicer looking product, um, you know, they're a little bit, they're a lot, they're more expensive typically. They're a lot more work. People think it's just throw them into a tank of beetles and that's not really the case. You know, they need to be, um, you know, the beetles have to be babysat pretty good and they've got to be, uh, you know, degreased thoroughly and whitened thoroughly and the degreasing takes a long time. And um, Yeah, so I would say beetles are the better product, but a lot of guys don't, they don't uh, necessarily care and they just want uh you know about the the fine bone or whatever and and some guys like a little bit of a yellower look and so i mean different people have a different thing they're looking for so um but if you want that like you know museum quality nice white bone strong bone skull mount uh, beetles are for sure your way to go and is there a cost difference between the two if i remember correctly i think beetles are like a little bit more expensive yeah there's um you know, um, I mean, that just goes to the to the time, like when you're degreasing them and you're right. changing degreasing baths, and and you know, so they are typically more expensive. Different places will have different ways of pricing that kind of stuff. Okay. So, but uh, yeah. Um, tips on bear hide preps for rugs and soft tanning. Uh, tips on bear. I mean, it's the same as as uh, as anything. Um, mm. You know, if you're looking to do it yourself, as far as like doing the whole caping out process, just make sure you get as much fat off of that hide as you can when you're going to be salting it before getting it to a tannery. Um, you know, salt will typically penetrate only a quarter of an inch. So if you've got big globs of fat and meat on there, it's not doing anything to the hide underneath. And that's where you're wanting to have the curing take place. Maybe talk so, about that for a second, because I don't think a lot of, I think they think that it's, you're trying to stop the meat from rotting, but if I'm correct, it actually has more to do with stopping the hair from falling out at a, at a later date. So maybe just a brief overview of why we salt hides in the first place. Well, you're trying to, um, <clears throat> you're trying to basically stop bacterial growth and so bacteria grows in moisture so you're wanting to suck all the moisture out and dry it out and um so yeah i mean on top you you have your hide and then on top of a, the hide is this little layer called the epidermis or whatever i might be screwing that up i'm not a, you know i'm not familiar with all the that kind of stuff but Close um, for us but there's a little, yeah, <laughs> there's a little film that basically the hair all sits in. And once bacteria starts to set in, 
that will just kind of slide off in sheets. Okay. And um, so that's what, what is referred to as slippage. Gotcha. And uh, so you'll see like uh, anywhere where bacteria started to set in before the salt was able to cure it, you know, once it goes into tanning, that will kind of separate from the hide itself and fall off. So you can look at a hide and think it's going to be good, and it'll go into the tanning process and it'll fall off. Sometimes guys will be like, well, you know, it was fine, and then it, it got wrecked at the at the tannery, which isn't the case. It's that bacteria sets in before the salt could do its work. Okay. So it, it kind of shows itself up later. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, basically it has, you know, two – two um, reasons for doing it. One is to stop the bacteria and dry it out. And the other is to kind of lock and set that, that hair down. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So we were on, we were on tips for bear hides. We want to get rid of all the meat before we put the salt on. Now for a guy like myself, I've never actually done pause and the skull. Like when I bring my stuff to you, I do a good job of the cape, but because I, because I normally can get it to you within two or three days, or I'm able to freeze it first. So I don't have to worry about them, um, rotting. I've never had to do the pause and the skull before, but I think it's probably something I want to spend some time yeah, learning to of. do. Yeah. And, and in all honesty, the like nine, five percent of what comes then comes in like that you okay. know um bears and stuff i mean typically if you can get it uh you know spring bears i mean you want to get it if you're going to go the freezer route um you want to get it into a freezer you know the sooner the better i mean they're and they're all different so there's no hard and fast rule like long will a will a hide last like the different hides will last different lengths of time so and and it depends on the conditions you know um you know like there's bacteria like you know a bear could have just had its, its face in a gut pile or something and had all this bacterial all over its face, it'll, you know, that'll set in quicker and cause slippage quicker. There's no way for you to really know that. Right. Um, so, um, if you can get it into a freezer right away, that's, uh, sorry, I got somebody just keeps trying to call me. Here. <laughs> just no worries. Um, um, yeah. So anyway, um, no, I lost my train of thought here. If we can get it into a freezer right away. Yeah, if you can get it into a freezer right away, that's best. And then, um, you know, bring it in and, and, and we'll skin out the rest for you. Um, and that's, like I said, that's about how 95% of them come in. Okay. Okay. Um, and with bears, I mean, when you're doing just another tip on yeah, yeah. you're skinning them, especially if you're skinning them out for the rug. Um, before you gut them, like a lot of guys, they'll start their, um, they'll start their, their incision, like they'll go up the bed. So you want to do a straight cut up the belly, but, but what I recommend, and this is just to help you with straight lines on your legs is before you make your center incision, before you even gut it, um, you know, from the front legs, punch your knife in right at the pad, like stretch that leg out, punch your knife in at the pad, make your leg incisions first. That'll help you line them up so that they're even on both sides. Cause once you've unzipped his, uh, uh, you know, that center cut, um, it's a lot harder to get those cuts to line up. You can't really really see because the bear starts to twist and distort so if you make ah, your leg cuts first okay um you know then they're then they match up on the same side on both sides so you get a much more symmetrical looking rug or hide or whatever so so that's it's not a crucial thing but it's uh just helps me make for a little bit nicer of a product in the end no that makes sense and i've actually and, heard... and it helps you no go ahead go ahead well i was just gonna say i've actually heard it's uh where you make those leg cuts is somewhat more important on a rug than even potentially a full body mount because when you're rewrapping the entire full body mount, if you're a little bit off, you're not going to really recognize it because the whole thing is going to be covered. But with, with a rug, you're going to have one side of the leg. Like you don't have the ability to sew it back together. So the one side of the leg is going to look all wonky because there's going to be a lot more hide over there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely with the rugs, it's more important. I mean, you can hide it on, on the full body mounts when you're stitching up. You can hide all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay. Could you, um, one of the things that I've been curious about as well. So somebody just wants to know the overall processes and steps, and I'm, I'm sure this is different for each animal, but the other thing is like taxidermy takes a long time. And I'm assuming just because we've had this conversation before, that's not all on you. A lot of stuff gets sent out. There's bottlenecks in the supply chain and the rest of it. But like, 
What's the like life cycle of a piece of taxidermy from when you first see it to the point where you actually give it back to the client? What are the individual steps? Okay, I, I missed a lot of that. You're, I think it was probably my phone cut out there, but I think what you're asking is um, the process, like what what's taking so long? Yeah. Is that the... Okay. Yeah, basically. Um, and then just the, the overall of the life cycle of a piece of taxidermy from the time somebody drops it off to the time it's it's ready to go home. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the basic thing that's going to affect turnaround time is uh, volume. And so, you know, all of our stuff kind of comes in in a couple of seasons and it comes in, you know, you'll spend your, your spring season just straight skinning bears and then and then shipping them off. So, so when something comes in, um, you know, we thaw it out, we skin it, we salt it. Um, you know, typically takes us, you know, a couple of days to, to thaw it, one or two days. And then, you know, we skin it out, salt it, sits in salt for a couple of days, gets hung to dry for a couple of days, and then it gets folded up and stored. Um, so it'll be stored. Basically, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. I've got uh, a tannery right beside me, so we just bring it over. But, um, you know, typically for other taxidermists, you wait until you have a bulk batch and then you ship them off to a tannery. And so at the tannery, I mean, everything's numbered and labeled. There's tags punched onto them and, and they go there. But um, basically... At that point, it's just volume. So when it comes in versus when it gets into the tanning tanks, like tanning itself doesn't necessarily take all that long. Um, just backlog is typically what's causing the holdup there. And, right. you know, they're, they're getting hundreds, if not thousands of hides in. And um, so there's only so fast you can process that stuff. That um, so from there, you know, sit at a tannery anywhere from, you know, one month to to eight, 10 months or whatever it is. And uh, um, then we get them back. We thaw them out. Like if it's, it'll be, uh, you know, a wet tan versus dry tan. Uh, rugs come back dry tan. So either way, we we um, we measure them and then we order forms that match. So then you're ordering your forms, waiting for a couple of weeks on shipping. And then at that point, they get stored in the freezer until we're ready to go on each specific project. And that it just goes kind of in numerical order or however they came in. And, uh, yeah, from when we mount it um, to when it dries is typically another two weeks waiting period there. That's really interesting. I wasn't aware that you couldn't. It kind of makes sense, but you can't order forms until you get the – that's definitely a bit of a glitch in the – like that would add some time to it for sure because until you've got something back to hand, obviously – You can in sure. some instances. Okay. Like if they come in like – you know, I've had, a, like, for myself, if I'm in the field, I can take certain measurements off the carcass and I'll know what to order. But most of them are coming in without that luxury. So right. that's why we do it that way. And then we try and order in bulk, right? Like, I mean, you don't want to just order one form for one project at a time. You wait till you have a bunch of them and try and get them all ordered up and and done that way. No, that makes that makes total sense. Um, and I've noticed this is this is, like... It's part of the industry. Like, I don't know anybody who is, um, especially in, in BC, like most stuff has a kind of year minimum turnaround time um, and seems to be growing a little bit. But I'm assuming that's because some of the popularity of hunting is growing a bit as well. So maybe more people are. Have you know, this is a bit of an off topic, Have you maybe because you're the guy to ask, do you think there's been an increase in the popularity of bear hunting specifically in the last, say, five to 10 years? Uh, yeah, I think so, hundred percent. Especially, okay. um, especially in the last two years, I think it, it got really popular. And I think a lot of that had to do with you know COVID and people not traveling. And you know, I think at the beginning there was a bit of a meat shortage, so everybody was out shooting bears because there was a big, uh, a big upswing then. Um, but definitely over the last five to ten years as well, I think social media has increased it. Um, you know, people are more aware of the need for predator control and predator management, and that's a you know, bear hunting, it's just a nice way to go hunt in the spring when there's nothing else open and bears are kind of a casual fun hunt. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, I've had a little pet theory, but I didn't have any way to prove it. But I was kind of all those reasons you just mentioned are things that I've kind of been contemplating as well, because I think I've kind of noticed an uptick. Um, in the, and primarily that like off season, like what else are you going to do? It's like right in the middle. Um, and it's a nice way to kind of break up that lull between if you, you know, there's a couple winter animals you can go after, but you know, most people haven't done anything since November. Okay. So we're back from a quick little break, uh, urgent delivery needed to get sorted out. Um, up next, 
Could you talk about any particular mount specific skinning techniques? Like for example, shoulder mount versus a full mount, like what people, is there anything specific to keep in mind or do differently in those circumstances? Uh, yeah, and it, it depends a little bit taxidermist to taxidermist and species to species. So recommend if you know who's going to be doing the mount ahead of time to call them and see how they like it. Um, you know, shoulder mounts, um, you know, some guys short wide incision versus a full long, you know, incision down the back of the neck. I know a lot of guys prefer the shortcut. I prefer the long cut. So, um, that's, uh, could you me, expand on that a little bit? I'm not sure what the difference between the, the two of those are. Well, on a short incision, you just make like a, like a six inch cut at the back of the head. And then you're trying to, you know, cape like tube the whole thing out. And then you're just, you can just a tiny little incision at the back there to try and get the antlers out and the skull out. Okay. Um, and the nice thing about that incision is for a taxidermist, there's way less sewing time. Um, the seam is going to look really nice because I mean, there is no seam. Um, the downside in my opinion is, uh, and you know, I feel like you're not quite getting the full size of the animal back out because you're having to slide it back on over like a sock. Whereas once it's opened up, you can really, um, you know, stretch that out a little bit easier and, and better in, in my mind. I mean, some people might disagree with that. And, and that's why I say, you know, ask, ask the guy that's going to be doing the mount for me. Um, you know, that seam up on the, on the wall there, you won't, won't, very noticeable regardless but um but definitely different taxidermists have different preferences uh when it comes to a rug you're going to want to do you know obviously that the cut up the belly and then and then up the legs um i find cutting up the legs it's a lot easier to start at the heel of the leg and cut towards the center than to cut from the center down a lot of guys end up in the wrong spot when they make when they do it that way um so that's one thing there. And then as far as for a full body mount, that again, very much depends on the taxidermist. There's dorsal cut, the belly cut. I prefer a dorsal cut on most long haired species. So, you know, um, bobcat, bears, lynx, things like that, a cut down all the way down the spine. And then you're kind of like peeling it down. You're cutting, you know, partly up the back of each leg, um, you know, maybe six inches. And and basically tubing that out. Those cuts for animals like that, that's how I would prefer it. I would not do that on, you know, something like a mountain lion, for example. That one, you definitely want to cut up the belly where the longer hair is. And what about a sheep? Um, sheep, again, a little bit depends on the pose you want to do, too. Um, you know, I can take it or leave it either way. I mean, I think a cut is is nice. You will have a little bit of a of a seam there potentially, but, um, typically you can hide them really well on those, on those animals. So, I mean, um, honestly for me, it's, it, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, I guess all things being equal. I would, I would take a dorsal on a sheep, but I mean, if you're going to do a lying down pose, um, you know, do it up the, up the belly okay. and then there's going to be no seam visible whatsoever. And, and so, I mean, those are the thing about and what about shoulder mounts? How far back do you recommend people go? And is this something where you like people tend to show up with it too short or, or making mistakes like that, or is more better? And then you've got some to trim if you don't need it. More is better. I mean, you know, if you're not sure, just cut it right down the middle of the, you know, at the center point of the animal. Um, typically as long as you're all the way behind the shoulders, um, you're good for a shoulder mount. You want to be down the legs a little bit too. So if you're down the legs, like, you know, if you make a conference cut, maybe four to six inches down the leg and then, and then tube those out or, or cut them up the back towards your, the barrel cut around your chest. Um, you know, that gives you plenty, that gives the guy plenty to work with. And, and, uh, you know, but I mean, if you're not sure or you're questioning it, just, you know, cut it in half in the tax service and trim it up. And, and, and then there's enough for a pedestal if they decide to do a pedestal type mount, which should become more popular. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how I would approach this. How much flushing is best to do in the field versus waiting until you get back home? Um, you know, I mean, for one, the more flushing you do in the field, the lighter it is to carry it out. Yep. Um, but some of the fine flushing is really, you know, time consuming. So, you know, get the bulk of it off 
Um, if you're like sheep hunting and you're up in the mountain, um, or even for bear or whatever, you know, and you're fleshing it, if, if you, you know, clean it up as best you can and then throw some salt on it and in an hour or two, it's going to kind of tighten all that, you know, sloppy flesh off and you can almost then scrape it off. Okay. Um, so, so that actually does help. It kind of like, you know, I don't know, it just tightens it up and then, and then you can just, you know, it's easier to cut off or scrape off and you can probably do a little bit more thorough of a job. I find, I mean, other people might disagree with that as well, but for me, I, I like fleshing them when they've had a little bit of salt on them to, to tighten it all up. Okay. That's good to know. Um, someone is doing an axis deer in Hawaii. What would be the best way to prepare your cape for the travel home? Um, if you have time, take it to a taxidermist out there, or if you know how to do it yourself, just, uh, you know, salt it, t- get it all turned, fleshed and salted and, and dried out. Um, you know, I have had them come in from Hawaii before with um, just frozen and that's fine. But, you know, the cleaner it is and the less, you know, blood there is, the less problems you're going to have with a potential squeamish border guy. Have you ever had so, skulls come back from Hawaii? Because that can be um, uh, tricky, bringing unprocessed skulls back. Um, have, have people shipped those to you before? Not shipped it. I mean, if you're bringing it in your luggage across, you could do that. But, um, you know, I wouldn't ship them like that. If you're going to get it shipped, then you may as well get them cleaned up over there um, would be my my suggestion. But, you know, it is very doable just to, you know, like if you clean the skull cap up, even if you don't, I mean, it's, there's nothing technically illegal about that. You just, what I recommend is if you're in Hawaii, call the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Hawaii. Yeah. And they'll give you a link there to a form called, it's called a 3177, I believe. It's, uh, you know, basically a export declaration. And you fill that out, keep your tag and license with you. Um, once you get to the border or back to our country, you know, you can show them that stuff. And um, you'd have to stop at the, I think at the airport and, in Hawaii, I'm not sure where they've got their fish and wildlife office there, but they'll stamp it and clear it for you on the spot. And I think they're pretty good with that kind of stuff. But definitely, if you're doing a trip, just call Fish and Wildlife Hawaii. Um, they'll answer your questions and tell you how to do it. And it's not really all that complicated. Yeah, I got a goat when I was in Hawaii with the bow. And luckily, the guide, all, you know, was, was happy to do the Euro. I was still staying on the island for a couple, I was actually on Maui and I was staying for a few more days. So he processed the Euro and that way it was very simple because I was bringing home like a clean skull and and horns that, um, I had taken myself. So I was able to just like walk right through with everything. But I know before I've had issues, not issues so much, but they lacked clarity at the border about, the skull itself. Like I've come home with lots of meat from the States and lots of other things, but sometimes in order to um, keep things simple, I've dropped my Euro off south of the border and then I just drive back over and pick it up a couple months later because then it's just something I don't need to worry about because I find some of the, it's not necessarily what you're allowed or not allowed to do. It seems to be the lack of familiarity with wild game regulations at the border. Like they don't know the first, most of those guys don't know the first thing about it. And then they got to look it up and then you're sitting there for 45 minutes. And like, sometimes it's simpler just not to get in that situation. hundred percent. I mean, you know, as far as the legality of it, it's not super complicated, but to a lot of the guys at the border, I think it's the first time they're seeing that scenario. And, And, you know, they start to confuse things with like, you know, domestics and, you know, foot and mouth type regulations and, and stuff like that. And so, you know, I've had it even like we do wildlife exports to the U S a lot. And, um, you know, I, luckily I deal with fish and wildlife in Washington and they're pretty good to go, but every so often you end up with a, with an agriculture, um, guy at the border and, and they've all been good, but they definitely, it doesn't come across their desk as often. So, you know, there's a lot more, waiting around and getting them to figure things out and you know the cleaner it is the more likely they are just going to wave you through or you know look at your documents and and you know send you on your way if it looks like it's rotten and disgusting and they might cause you some problems or if it's you know leaking out of the bag i I will say too for people listening to this who do decide to go hunting in the states you're also going to want to look at the state specific regulations around uh, with the spread of CWD, there's a lot of individual states that you're not allowed to move, particularly spine. Um, 
material um, between, like you can't cross state lines with with certain particular bones and parts of the animal. Um, so if that's the case, you can get in big, big trouble because you're actually breaking federal laws at that point. So it wasn't as much of an issue well, a few years ago, but that's something else you want to you wanna keep in mind. And I should know this better than I do right now, but I believe that that's true for BC too. You can't bring, I don't think it's true for like access deer, but that's something I haven't looked up. So maybe I should look that up or call, call the uh, conservation officer on that one. But, um, but I think with, you know, whitetail and mule deer, I, I do think that they need to be fully clean. Now I know from Alberta, they do. I'm assuming yeah. from the U S they would as, as well. So, you know, just, and for the, I mean, when I'm doing exports, I don't give people the option. We clean everything thoroughly yeah. um, before before going, just because I don't need the headache of it. And um, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's not hard to find someone there to clean them up, or even just to boil it off real quick yourself, and and before you drive up, and and then you know everything's following whatever regulations there would be, and and you'll just have an easy time with with uh you know canadian customs or u.s guys yep 100 percent. do your homework beforehand it is tricky stuff to look up though too sometimes because you'll see certain regulations and like look you know written different in different places but anyways just do your homework before you go um yeah best way we kind of covered this already but he gives a very specific situation so let's say you get a bear on day one and you're on a five-day hunt you're in the back country and you're not solo you're with other dudes so you and your bear are going to be sitting in the in the woods and let's say it's it's not an overly hot hunt because i think if you're hot this is kind of a moot point but let's say it's cool enough that you can keep the hide cool you have time knives and salt um what's the best practice um, you know, bring like before you do a hunt like that, look up how to cape and cape them, um, you know, or bring a freezer along with a generator. Okay. Um, you know, but, uh, if you don't have access to a freezer, I mean, the bear can spoil even in cool temperatures relatively quickly. Um, they tend to spo spoil quicker than, you know, deer or sheep, but, uh, um, yeah, if you plan on staying there and, and trying to get a whole bunch, I mean, you know bring a freezer along in a generator or, or learn how to cape them and clean them up. And, you know, if you take your time and, um, it's a pretty doable thing for most guys to do. And, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a learning process, I'm sure. And, you know, like I said, you know, get a, get a download a video or two on your phone so you can watch as you're doing it. And, um, you know, better to try and do them before you, like, if you shoot something that you're not going to mount, you know, take the, like, use that opportunity to practice and, and make the mistakes on that. Do you have any particular knife recommendations? And do you think you need, like, if you're going to getting into the kind of like turning lips and ears inside out, do you, do you like having a secondary, like almost like a Havilon or something really small like that? Or are you doing everything with like the same type of processing knife and what type of processing knife do you yourself recommend? Um, I use almost entirely just a regular, I think it's a number four handled scalpel with the uh, number 22 scalpel blades. And then I use that for pretty much everything. I mean, I've even, you know, done an entire moose with that start to finish. Wow. Um, so I like that. That's just what I'm comfortable with. I mean, use what you're comfortable with. Um, but definitely for, you know, um, being, lips and ears and stuff like that i find scalpels to be pretty handy now i mean some guys might find them to be too sharp and they're gonna you know put a pile of pile of holes in that way but for me i, I prefer it that way okay um and here's another here's a specific situation about a full body mount for black tail uh if you want to do a full body mount black tail um where would you make your primary cuts um, again, like think about the pose and like, is it going to be high up on the wall? But, um, you know, I, I prefer on, on a deer like that, uh, a dorsal cut. So you're going to cut just from the back, neck, start at the back, neck, cut down the spine. You know, if you're going to, you're going to be turning it to one side or the other. I mean, you know, if you're going to be turning it to the left, you can stay to the, to the right side of the spine. So that incision's less visible. Um, you know, we do a pretty good job of hiding those anyway, but, uh, but you know just for extra thoroughness you can if you if you already know where you're going to turn it you know kind of skin off to one side so that it's hidden 
Um, and then you're going to cut up the back of each leg, basically from the back of the hoof to the knee. And then you're going to start down and, um, and tubing that all out like the, the upper legs and stuff. And so it's a little bit longer of a process skinning that way, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it works well. And then, um, you know, if it's going to be a lying down pose, then I definitely think, you know, cut it up the belly like you would a bear rug. But you're going to have to come down the back a bit anyways. So, like, you know, down the back of the neck to get the antlers out. So, right. um, you know, I usually just carry on with that incision. Okay, that makes sense. So we've hit up most of the major questions, and I was wondering if maybe just based on your experience and how many years you've been doing this, are there mistakes you see people make that, you know, you could give us some advice that that – you know, to help us not make or their particular, any, any, any particular pieces of advice you have for, for people that might be newer to, to doing their own caping and, and getting their own animals done? Now there's a few things, um, you know, like, uh, number one, you don't need to cut the throat on an animal. So it's not going to bleed out when you, um, so don't cut the throat if you're going to mount it. Okay. Um, next one is, rock salt versus fine salt who's fine salt I get, you know i get a pile like rock salt will work but it doesn't work nearly as well okay um and it's kind of a mess and you know the fine salt is infinitely superior to rock salt no matter whose uncle told you what so <clears throat> i love it um and then the other one um, like a question that i get and i don't think any of your readers sent it in but or our listeners sorry um is freezing or salting and freezing and right you always hear people say well if you're going to salt it don't freeze it if you're going to freeze it don't salt it and there's truth in both camps so i mean you don't want to you know if you've got a raw animal there and you throw a bunch of salt on it and you stick it in your freezer for two or three years the salt prevents it from freezing thoroughly or solidly right so so i mean you can run into problems with that but you know, like, for example, if a guy, you've got the head and feet in your bear, you're going to throw it in the freezer. I actually don't mind if a guy salts it, then rolls it up and throws it in the freezer. Because when I go to thaw it, it'll unravel way quicker and thaw okay. way quick. But you don't want to store it like that for a very long period of time okay. um, because it does prevent it from freezing. Like, I mean, a few weeks is no problem. Um, but, you know, for for super long period of time you can run into problems and then same with a hide that's been completely flesh turned and everything and salted you know once the salt has cured it um throwing it in a freezer won't hurt it um, in fact it actually you know you, you prevent anything from from getting at it mice or bugs or whatever um you know salting typically it's once it's salted it can stay at room temperature and it's not a problem but i mean you do run at least a little bit of a risk of of um you know bugs or, or mice getting at it. So if it's in a freezer, but the key there is make sure that it's fully cured and dried before freezing it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But, but totally like a salt cured hide that's properly fleshed and turned does not need to be frozen. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Well, the last thing I'm curious about Ray is you got any good hunting plans this year or you, you know, this is a funny thing. People get jobs like yours because they love hunting and then they be in, they end up being so busy during hunting season, they barely get to do any of their own. So what's on your radar for this year? This is the first year, um, first year that I can remember where I have zero plans. Wow. I haven't planned anything yet. Um, it's just been, the, the year has been a blur. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it feels like it's still January 3rd and we're already in May. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I don't have any plans this year. I'll probably do a little bit of spring bear. Um, you have to guide a little bit of spring bear as well. So, um, we'll do that. Uh, in the fall, I was, you know, last year kind of flirting with the idea of going sheep hunting, but uh, I don't think that's going to be in the cards for this year. So. Um, yeah, I don't really know a little bit of deer around here. We'll throw in some LEHs and see what happens there, but, uh, nothing, nothing solid for sure. Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm headed up on, how about you? I'm head, I'm, I, I'm pretty excited this year. Um, I'm, I'm doing solo sheep. I'm flying in on the 31st, going to go in for two weeks. So I'm feeling pretty good. It'll be a good trip nonetheless. Um, 
so ho- you'll you'll know if it was a good trip because I'll call you on my way on my way back home and come drop something off at your house. And then my old man lives in Ontario, and my brother's never been hunting before. And I'm trying to organize a caribou fly in at a Dece, which, as you're well aware, is kind of up in the air right now because of everything that's going on. And they've kind of put a halt on permits to a company. So if he gets that permit to a company, we'll do a fly-in caribou hunt. If he doesn't, maybe we'll just stick with moose or maybe I'll call an audible and do something else. But either way, me, the old man, and the brother are going to do kind of a more family-style hunt in September, which isn't my typical style, but I'm really looking forward to it because it'll be the first time the three of us, and the old man's getting a bit older and probably doesn't have a whole lot of backcountry hunts left in him. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. And then the last hunt, I'm going to go to kind of north of Edmonton to do some whitetail hunting with the bow in pro- probably the third week in November, which is not, again, that's kind of out of my comfort zone. I just did my first kind of stand whitetail hunting last year. And um, did you know, um, shit, Melvin, who owned uh, Rock Creek Outfitters? He just passed away. Um, I knew, yeah, I knew he passed away. I didn't know him um, personally. I knew of him. I knew who he was, and I, I had uh, clients and friends that that knew him and always spoke really highly of him. But uh, yeah, but, yeah, I, I didn't know. Him it personally. was wild, man, because my forestry company that I worked for for five years, we used his camps in the off season uh, for doing layout. And so I knew of Melvin for a long time. And then I'd been meaning to go do, he kind of has this meat hunt, like, you know, 2,500 bucks and you can go, um, I think you can shoot a doe and a buck, but they're, they're not big deer, but but I thought it was, I've always thought it was a great thing to go and do in December. And I never got around to it. And I finally booked it and like, yeah, a week before the hunt, the guy passes away and his wife ended up running the hunts anyways. And I had a great time. That camp is kind of in a cool spot and didn't see any monster bucks, but whatever. I had fun and I took a bow or I took a doe with the bow, but I kind of got into stand hunting. Like I, it was a totally different challenge. Like I'm used to these kind of like more crazy backcountry things. And I really enjoyed the different challenge of trying to sit still for, you know, several hours in a row in the cold. So I kind of looked around and found this place in Alberta where I'm going to go in November. So those are kind of my big three. So hopefully, hopefully we're able to punch at least one tag between, between those three. Yeah, no kidding. That'll be, that'll be a good time. I mean, the best hunt that I ever did in recent years, I mean, we go, we've done, you know, flying sheep and goat and different things like that. And always had a good hunt, but, uh, did a hunt with uh, me, my brother, my dad and his long-term hunting partner did a fly in moose hunt and, and hands down best trip I've ever had. Like it was just, uh, yeah, those are, those are hunts you got to do. Well, and I think it's kind of special because you get the, yeah, I agree. And it also, it gives you the kind of isolated wilderness experience, but you can bring a couple more amenities. And I think that's what I'm kind of looking for. Like it's still going to be quiet. We'll still be by ourselves, but you know, we're going to bring the 12 man TP and the wood stove and have a bit more creature comforts. Um, so oh yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes it a lot more enjoyable. You know, we had the wall tent along yeah. a few cases beer and a boat and uh you know it was just a much more casual hunt and you know it was uh but it, it was a good time and uh yeah really glad that i did that we'd always me and my brother talked about it for a while because we were always you know doing a, a sheep hunt or whatever and like you know we got to make time to go do a, a moose hunt and when we did it it was totally worth it it was awesome yeah i'm excited for sure well, listen, Ray, I, I really want to thank you for your time. And, and who knows, maybe, maybe next season when, when a bunch more questions pile up, we could have a round two of this. But I think this is going to, I think it comes at a good time of year. And I think we've got a lot of good practical information out there for everybody. So thanks again for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate the opportunity. All right, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, you too.